You are listening to a recording from Shepherd's Grace Baptist Church, located in Sandpoint, Idaho. We invite you to come and join us as we rightly divide the word of truth and encourage one another through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here is our pastor and preacher, Eric Clerk. Let's open up our Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. We are making some progress, one verse at a time. It's an amazing, amazing book. Just love it. Praise God for that. Praise God that He gave us His inspired Word. I've really been thinking about it this week, how the Lord gave us His inspired Word. David says, when, in, in Psalm 138 verse 2, he says, I'll worship towards thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Amen. Loving kindness. I'll tell you some more about loving kindness in another message one of these days. It is absolutely amazing. If you want to know the short answer, you know what loving kindness means? He, he delivers you out of the junk that you are in. That's what loving kindness does. Loving kindness is amazing, God's loving kindness. We will be 10,000 years from now, up in eternity, and we'll still be able to, to not even grasp the idea of loving kindness of God. It's amazing what His loving kindness is. When you study that out, it's, it's beyond our comprehension. That's really what it is. Well, okay, let's get back to Revelation 3. Let's read verse 18. It is a wonderful verse. This is the... Cure. So he gave us their condition. They were lukewarm, right? He, he says they gave us the cause for why were they lukewarm? It's because they puffed themselves up, right? And they didn't know that they were wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I, I uploaded last week's sermon. I called it, I said they are carnal, they are vain, they malnourished, bribe accepting nudists. But that's exactly what the Lord says. It's just, it hits home sometimes when we just. Look at it and see what these things really mean. That's your Christians today. So let's take a look at what is the cure. What is the cure for this condition that most Christians find themselves in? And we find the cure here in verse 18. Let's read it together. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and bright raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Take a note there, a couple of things. There's three things in the Lord's cure here. Number one is they need to buy of Him gold that's tried in the fire. We're going to look at that. It also says to get white raiment, that the shame of their nakedness does not appear. There's shame in your nakedness. If you're a naked Christian, there's shame in that. You're going to stand before the Lord naked. We saw that last week. And that is not a good thing. You want to have something on, right? I mean, imagine the President of the United States was to come to your house, okay? Well, let's say somebody else. Like somebody like, let's say, you know, some famous person was coming to your house. And you open the door and you were in the buff. I mean, wouldn't you be ashamed if like all these cameras of all these different news outlets were recording it? Well, how's it going to be when you stand before the holy and true God? How is that going to be when you stand before Him, before all the holy angels, and you are totally naked? Wow, that's just something. And number three on that list is ISAF, so that you can see. That will heal your spiritual blindness, right? So we're going to look at those three things. We're going to look at it real quickly, because I want to show you how those things come together in the Word of God. Two passages out of the Old Testament that's just absolutely amazing. And so we're going to have to be moving fast, but the First thing I want to do is just go back to chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1. I just want you to see something there. Just a short verse, but you've got to see it. Laodicea is at the end of the church age. Laodicea is also at the end of the tribulation. That means the Lord is coming back. He's coming back for His church at the rapture to take us out of here before the tribulation begins. And He also comes back at, at the second advent at the end of the tribulation. So you've got to understand that what we're reading here has double application. And we are in that church in Laodicea. Read for me, chapter 1, read for me, verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. 
Notice those last couple of words, for the time is at hand. We see stuff happening in the Middle East, and we know the clock is ticking. We're coming up to a 2,000-year church age that's almost done. Do you know what, Christian? The time is at hand. And it says here that blessed are they that do the things that's in this book. So it's an important book for us to study, but it's also in reference to the whole Bible. There's, there's, there's blessings if you obey what God says in His Word. Okay, so let's take a look at this gold tried in the fire. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's go over to 1 Peter. Remember, this is doctrinally tribulation, but there's also a lot in 1 Peter that we can apply practically to us. There's a lot of good sound doctrine in there. Let's take a look. 1 Peter chapter 1. What is this gold tried in the fire? I mean, can't I just go to a coin exchange or whatever and buy myself some gold? Why do I have to get gold tried in the fire? What's the difference? It's the difference between our gold and God's gold. His gold is pure. His gold is eternal. Our gold, you know, muffin dust corrupts. Okay? Read for me chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Read for me verse 6. Sounds like a paradox. You're rejoicing on the one side, but you're also in, in, in heaviness because of the temptations. God's going to allow you to go through some things in life. And there's something that you need to know right from the get-go. Before we even go deeper into this, there's something that you need to know. God will allow you. When you sow to the flesh, God will allow you to reap in the flesh. Yeah. But the reason God allows that to happen, the reason you give your kid a spanking, when they were naughty, is not to beat them down. It's to correct bad behavior, right? right? So God ultimately wants you to succeed. He wants you to prevail. A parent that doesn't discipline a child is not a good parent. Mm -hmm. It's a bad parent. Right. God is the ultimate example of a good father. Yeah. I mean, He loves us so much that He Himself came down and died for us. And, I mean... I mean couldn't help listen to the words as Allison and Wesley were singing it how God can do that I mean no it, it, it brings tears to your eyes when you when you think about that 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 is the example of good father one who would lay down his own life for us and and the Lord Jesus Christ did that for us right so God when he lets you go through temptation there there is there there is a hardness that we, we are gonna have to there's there's a heaviness that we're going to have as we go through these temptations. But God's not allowing us to go through it because He wants us to fail. He wants us to succeed. There's something that you need to remember is He's always he's worth you. If you're a child of God, God is worth you, even though you're going through this trial. When a soldier goes into boot camp, they, they beat them down in boot camp. It's hard. Boot camp is really hard. I remember when we were in basic training, man. It, it really it stank. It was not good. But the reason they let you go through all that stuff is because they want to ultimately produce a good soldier. You see, that's the purpose of it. It's not to, to take you and, 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 and have you crumble and, and lay there and feel sorry for yourself. They want you to get up there, shake the dust off and keep going. That's what God wants for you to do. So read that in this. You have to rejoice in this. Even though there is some heaviness, you've got to rejoice in that, right? Okay, read the next verse, verse 7. Do you know who that praise and honor and glory is for? It's for you at the judgment seat of Christ. That's what it is. A lot of people will read that and think that it's talking about the praise and honor. Ultimately, what you are doing is you're doing it for the praise and honor and glory of God. But the Lord Jesus Christ, at the judgment seat of Christ, are going to take certain individuals and He's going to say, you were a good and faithful servant in front of all the holy angels. And all the other people standing there naked. He's going to say, good servant, because you were faithful in a few things. He's going to give you many cities to rule over during the millennial kingdom. That's your millennial inheritance. 
So there's going to be honor and place at, at, at the judgment seat of Christ. And it's for those Christians who can persevere, who can make it through these trials. And it's better than the gold that perishes. We are talking about eternal rewards. That's what we're talking here. Look at what your attitude should be regarding this. Read verse 8. Yeah, joy unspeakable. Go over to chapter 4. Let's be the chapter 4. Let's just look at this real quick. The trials that you will go through is going to be for the Word of God and it's going to be for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Most Christians today are not enduring persecution for the Word of God. The Word of God is His inspired Word of God. It's the one that you have on your laps. It's not those other books that call Lucifer the morning star, calls him God. It's not, the, it's not those other books, okay? If, if you are going through trials for that, then that is just you reaping what you sowed. You know, if you get into a debate with a Jehovah Witness and he's running circles around you and you're using the New American Standard Bible, you're not suffering for Christ. <laughs> You're just suffering because you were stupid enough to think that that's the Word of God. Right? So remember that. The sufferings that, for, that are for God, that you're going to suffer, is going to be persecution for the Word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's the Gospel. That's people coming after you because you're preaching the pure, undefiled Gospel. Not another Gospel, the real Gospel. First Peter 4, read for me verse 12 and 13. Let's just do them both. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. So when his glory is the real, for you and I, that's the rapture. For a tribulation saint, that's going to be the second advent. But for us, when we stand before Him at the rapture, at the judgment seat of Christ, when we stand before Him and His glory is revealed, we want to be exceeding joyful. You don't want to be ashamed. You see that there's a contrast. There's some who's going to be joyful and there's going to be some that's going to be ashamed. Go to John chapter 4. We're going to move fast. Well, they talk way too much. John chapter 4. We want to look at something here. Gold in the Bible is also associated with deity. We see in Psalm 45 that the queen at the marriage feast of the Lamb, the queen there, which is the bride, she's dressed in gold. That's us. And we also see in Revelation chapter 21 that the New Jerusalem, which is the bride coming out of heaven, the New Jerusalem is also a city of pure gold. So gold is important, right? Okay, let's go to John chapter 4. I want you to see something here, something very important the, the Lord tells the woman at the well. Read for me verse 23 and verse 24. But the hour is coming, and now is at hand, wherein the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship them. God is a spirit, and they that worship them must worship them in spirit and in truth. Notice, true worshippers worships God in spirit and truth, right? Yeah. And what does it say? God is a spirit and they that worship Him must. That's the Lord Jesus Christ speaking and saying we must worship Him in spirit and truth, right? Now, what is, what is spirit? That means that you're saved and that means that you walk in the spirit. In other words, you can't serve God, you can't worship Him when you're in the flesh. When you go to one of these Christian rock concerts, and it's all emotion-driven, you know, all, all the stuff came out of the Second Great Awakening, by the way. It was all emotion-driven, driven by the flesh. When you are driven by the flesh, and you are in the flesh, guess what? You can worship all you want, but God's not deceiving that worship. You know what the word and mean? And means it's a conditional statement. Both conditions have to be met. If I told my child to go to the store and buy bread, 
If they go to the store and they buy candy, they didn't do what I asked them to do. If they go to the, the ballpark and play, they didn't do what I asked them to do. They have to go to the store and buy bread. Both of those things come home and then they were doing what I asked them to do, right? So it says here, you have to be in the spirit and in the truth. What is the truth? It's the word of God. Now, if, if, a, if, if a book calls Lucifer God, is that the truth? No. no. So how can you worship God if you go to a church where they're using the ESV or the NASV or the New International Version? Or what about the New King James Version? I'm going to show you some things out of the New King James Version today. I'm going to show you some stuff that's going to make the head on your back stand up. It is that profound. I've got an NKJV here today. I call it the nudist King James Version because it's for naked Christians. They're going to be naked before the judgment seat of Christ. All their worship is going to burn. You know what it says? It says we need to, it's going to, the fire is going to reveal what it is, whether it's gold, silver, or precious stones, right? And then it gives us the contrast, wood, hay, and stubble. Do you ever ponder to think about that? Wood, hay, stubble? Remember what I told you last week? There's three satanic holidays that people celebrate, right? Okay, wood. Where do, where do you get wood from? Tree. A tree. Christmas. Hay. Hay is glass that withered if it dies. What is that? Halloween. Yes. Stubble. Stubble is the, uh, the opposite of stone. Now, just so you understand something here, watch this, okay? Instead of going door knocking, silver is, is giving people the gospel, Right? So instead of going door knocking, that would be silver. You get hay. Okay? What is hay? Hay is instead of going to the door knocking, saying, I want to give you the gospel, you go to the door and you say, trick or treat. Do you see that? You're doing the exact... You're going to a door, but instead of giving them the gospel, you're giving them a, a saying, a message that's from the devil. And they get hay for that. Okay? And then stubble is the opposite of stone. What, if you study it out in your Bible, you'll see that the Passover is connected with stones. When Jesus walked up on the path there, they said to him, tell these disciples to quit saying that he is the king, the king of David. And then they say, he said to them that if the, if the disciples don't say it, the stones will cry it out. Right. Stones is connected with, with his crucifixion. If you look at, there's a stone rolled in front of the tomb, right? And the stone was rolled away. Stone is connected with that. Do you know that Astaroth... Astaroth, the city of Astaroth, where King Og was the king, in Deuteronomy 1 verse 4, it says it was in Adre. Adre, if you go there today, it's, it's, it's like saying Sandpoint in Bonner County. Okay? You can see in the Bible, sometimes it will say uh, Astaroth and Adre. Sometimes it say Astaroth in Adre. It means the same thing. It's like saying Sandpoint in Bonner County or Sandpoint and Bonner County. It's, it, you can say both. When you go there today, there's still remnants of houses that were built there. The walls was made out of stone. The roofs were made out of stone. The walls, everything, the big wall around this, everything was made out of stone. Stone, 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 stone. Astaroth is associated with stone. Isn't that something? And that's the, the celebration of Ishtar, which is Easter. It's wood, hay, stubble. That's what a lot of Christians are going to get. Naked Christians are going to get that. So what would you rather have? Gold? Or wood. It's just simple. Just the, where, where, where is your affection? That's just what it is. I'm so proud of my little girl. She was driving with Julia in the car. And she looked and she said, Mama, I absolutely hate Halloween. Absolutely hate it. Do you know that? The Bible says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. You can't love both. You just can't. Okay? So you have to worship God in spirit and truth. Okay? Let's move on to the... The righteousness. Go to Revelation chapter 16. A lot of Christians are going to get wood, hay, and stubble. It's going to burn up. They're going to say, well, God knew my heart as their faces are filled with smoke. Let's go to Revelation chapter 16. Let's look at this. White robes, that the shame of your nakedness does not appear. Revelation 16, read for me verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. 
So we see again, the Bible tells us there's shame in nakedness, right? Okay, and the tribulation, you could lose your garments. It can be taken from you. It can be stolen from you. Stolen because you put your affection somewhere else and you took that mark of the beast, right? And you lose your garments. Okay, you and I, today, we can, our, our, what we can lose is the wards. That's what you can lose. You have salvation if you're saved. That's your standing, but your state. That is your walk. That's your rewards. That's what it is. Go to chapter 19, Revelation 19. Here's a direct reference to the church. This is us. Read for me verse 7 and verse 8. The fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. You and I, when we get saved, we receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's our standing. But you also have a righteousness of your own. That's your state, your walk. And that's what it's talking about here. Your white linen is going to depend on your walk. And you don't want to be ashamed and be found naked when you stand before Him. You see that? There's something really deep in this. I'm not going to go into it, but I wonder where those are that are naked because those who are coming down for the wedding are wearing gowns. Where's, where's those who were naked? Maybe, maybe did they receive a gown? Did, did the Lord give them a sympathy gown like one of the ones you'll find at the hospital that just barely covers? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to have a really nice gown decorated with gold, silver, and precious stones? One that is really good looking as opposed to just like a little thin little cloth thingy, yeah. right? I don't know. Maybe they don't even get that. I don't know. There's some things in the Bible I just don't know because we don't have enough scripture to make a case either way. I'm just saying you want to be on the safe side. Make sure you get a garment, right? Okay, let's move on to this blindness thing. I want you to see something anointing and that's the work of the Holy Spirit. By the way, all three of these things, Buy of me gold. God is the Spirit, right? That's God the Father. The, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's his, the tabernacle, right? That's the second one, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the third one is the anointing. When you see the word anoint, that's the Holy Spirit, right? So you see all members of the Godhead in the cure. You see that? That's just a side note. Okay, let's go to John chapter 9. Back to the book of John. John 9, we have a blind guy that deceives his eyesight and his eyes are anointed by the Lord. We can learn a little bit from this. What is he going to see? Let's take a look here. Now, there's a lot of verses to cover, but we're just going to try and do a couple of them. Read for me verse 6 and 7. So notice something. The Lord anointed his eyes with this clay. And then he told them to go do something. What, what do we take from this? He went and did what the Lord told him to do. And then he saw. There are many Christians today who have deceived the Holy Spirit because they are saved. But they haven't gone and done what the Lord told them to do. Therefore, they don't see. That's why they are still blind. You start seeing here how this cure works. You got to take the ointment and do something with it. What the Lord told you to do. What would have happened if this guy decided, well, I don't want to go wash in the, you know, Salom. I, I want to go somewhere else. Just go home and wash his face with water in, the, in his bathroom. Did he do what the Lord told him to do then? No. no. So you have to obey the Lord. That's when his eyes are getting opened. You see that picture there? Okay. Read for me 8 and 9. The neighbors therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind, said, Is not this he 
hath sat and begged. Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Okay, read for me the next two verses. Therefore said they unto him, How are thine eyes open? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. Now notice, what did he just call the Lord Jesus? He called him a man. Do you see that? A man named Jesus, right? Okay, drop down. So he's now getting interrogated by the Pharisees, the, the spiritual leaders, those who were all puffed up, thought they knew everything. They know how to translate from the Hebrew and the Greek, and they know what the word means in the Greek, and they know this and that. And this guy is just a blind fellow who knows nothing because he's just had his eyes opened. I mean, he never did anything in his life. How can he tell them anything, right? Isn't that how people think today? Okay, read for me verse 17. They said to the blind man again, What sayest thou of him, that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. Now he goes from calling him a man to calling him a prophet. Sounds like he's on the right path. He's on the right path, but he's not there yet, okay? Go down, drop down. There's a lot to read. I want to, when you get home later, I want you to read all this whole chapter, especially pay attention to 25, 26, 27, 28. But go down for me to verse 35. He read for me the next verse, verse 36. He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Notice something here. Does he believe yet? Not yet. Not yet. He says, Who is he that I might believe on him? But what did he call the Lord Jesus? Lord. Lord. He called him Lord. And is he saved? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. See? He calls him Lord. But he's not saved yet. He says, who is he that I may believe on him? He calls him Lord before he's saved. Just because somebody calls Jesus Lord. The new Lordship salvation is a false gospel. They preach that if you, if you profess Jesus as Lord. That's what the NIV says. Puts in quotation marks. The ESV says the same thing. The New American Standard says the same thing. If you, if you say that Jesus is Lord, they say you're saved. That's not what this says. It says here, he called him Lord. He's not even saved yet. Okay, read the next two verses. And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Yeah, you see that? Now he believes, and there's worship. Right? Okay. Well, just the real worship, not fake, emotional-driven worship. Worship has to be in the spirit and in truth, right? Okay, read for me verse 39. Look at the judgment. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. There's a lot of people today who are saved that are blind. And the Lord says, you should take the cure that you can see. And look at what He says. He called him Lord. So he goes for the, and he worships him, right? So he goes from calling Jesus a man to calling him a prophet to calling him Lord. You can tell a lot about a person who's all fixated on the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ was only a man. Tell a lot about a person who's like that. They focus in on his manhood. They don't, they don't focus in on the, the fact that he's God incarnate. It's very interesting. Now, I want to do something. I want to show you real quickly how these things come together. And I'm going to be pushed for time. But go to Job chapter 23. Job chapter 23. Job chapter 23. Job is a Jew in the tribulation. Right picture of it. 42 chapters, 42 months. Great tribulation. Job chapter 23. I want you to see something here. For the sake of time, I'm going to just 
say, say this. In 8 and 9, he's, he's looking for the Lord, but he doesn't see the Lord. The Jews in the tribulation, they're going through some, some stuff. They're going through a fiery trial, but they don't see the Lord. The Lord is coming, but they don't see Him. They have to walk by faith, right? Okay, read verse 10. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Okay, he knows the way. The way that I take. What is the way that he take? Take a look at this. Read for me 11. My foot hath held his steps. His way have I kept, and not declined. His way have I kept. Let's take a look. Read verse 12. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. The words, plural of his mouth. That's the, the word of God. That's what he gives us. So he has esteemed that more than his necessary food. That is something that we don't have in the church today. Christians today, they don't esteem the Word of God more than the necessary food. Christians today are so fixated, so blinded by these other false Bibles that they really don't esteem the Word of God. So take a notice here. In the Old Testament, a passage that has to do with where you see eyes, where you see Him you know, going through a trial with gold, has to do with the Word of God. Okay? It's a, there's a match here. Now, let's do this real quick. Go to Isaiah chapter 5. Let me show you another Old Testament use where we're going to see these three things that we find in the cure. Isaiah chapter 5. I'm trying to move fast because I want to show you some things in the New King James Bible that hopefully will help you open your eyes a little bit. Isaiah chapter 5, read for me verse 20. That is so true today. People are calling good evil and evil good, don't they? I mean, how dare you don't tolerate all this LB, QT, GT, whatever junk, right? They, they, they say you're a bad person if you don't tolerate that stuff. Yeah, they're calling evil good, right? Okay, read verse 21. See, there's your eyes, the eyes. That's the thing that somebody who is wise in their own eyes is somebody who is spiritually blind. Okay, take a look. So we see the eyes already here, right? Read verse 22 and 23. Read those two for me together. Well, well, them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. What was white robes? They were the righteousness of the saints, right? Notice here, righteousness takes away that. So this is somebody who concocts a strong drink, strong drink, spiritual strong drink. This is like doctrine. Calvinism is a perfect fit for what we're reading about here. Woe on that person, okay? Because what does it do? It messes up the other person's righteousness. Do you see that? You're leading somebody astray. This is the influence of the world. This is them messing with your righteousness. Here you see it. This is the white hope. So we've seen eyes. We've seen the righteousness. Now watch this next thing. Read verse 24. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and the Holy One of Israel. Wow! They despise the what? The Word. The Word. Isn't that true today? People despise the King James Bible. And notice there, fire. Those same three things. Gold tried in fire. You saw righteousness, the white robes. You see eyes, their own, their, their own deceit. Isn't that something? All three of those same things in, found in the Bible. Absolutely amazing. Let me show you something. I want to do this. I want to talk about the New King James Bible. 
Because many people think that it's just as good as the King James Bible. I have a question for you. You go to a restaurant. You sit down at your table. The lady who just seated you, she says, I will, I will have the servant come over and help you shortly. And then you say, excuse me, ma'am, could you just ask him to bring us some water? And then she says to you, well, let me just say, tell you something. They don't like to be called him. They should be referred to as them and they only. And now your waiter shows up. And it is a guy. And he's got these hairy hands. And he's about 65 years old. And he's got a scruffy voice. And he's all covered in you know, nail polish and mascara. And he comes up and he's dressed like a woman. And he says to you, Can I take your order? And you say, um, sir, tell me, what is your favorite? He says, oh, don't call me sir. Just refer to me as they. Well, I'm sorry, but the word they means more than one, doesn't it? In the English language. So we see this new push in society to really make people stupid, where they refer to a man or a woman as just they in the singular. It's, it's dumb. Now... The other thing is God created them male and female created he them okay male and female those are the only two genders you find in this bible there's no other gender right now you say to yourself where does this come from suddenly it's the last decade this stuff has become so prominent where you see these these guys with their fingernails all painted you know, working in the, the produce aisle over at Walmart or something, right? Sorting the apples. And you're like, don't touch it. I, I want to eat that. Okay. Now, now where, where did all this junk come from? Where did it come from? Let me show you. Let's take the new King James Bible. Robert, would you come help me here? You come up here. Stephen, you come up here. I gave Stephen a new King James Bible. The rest of you, open up your Bible to First Corinthians chapter 1. Let me show you something. This is unbelievable. You say, where did all this trans junk come from? It comes from books like the New King James Bible. I'm going to prove it to you. First Corinthians chapter 1. Robert, please do me a favor. Read for me verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Wise Men, right? Yes. Not many wise men. Not very mighty are called, right? Stephen, you read first the New King James Bible, verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Mm -hmm. wow. They took out men. You see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go on. Chapter 7. Both of you, go to chapter 7. I am skipping a lot of good stuff here. But for the sake of time, we're just going to go. Chapter 7. Robert, you read for me verse 17. But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. See, what it has to do with is being called into the ministry, right? Okay. Women pastors, where do they come from? Stephen, read for us verse 17. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordained in all the churches. Took out man. You can apply that to a woman. Yeah. Now, okay, let's take a look at something here. You're not going to believe this, okay? This is as creepy as that guy with the painted fingernails touching them apples and the bodies are. <laughs> verse 20. Read first verse 20, Robert. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Verse 20. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Women pastors. 24. Let's do verse 24. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. Let's look at the transvestite version. What does it say? <laughs> <laughs> brethren, brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. Yeah. Okay, let's go on. Go to chapter 11. So let me ask you a question. A few weeks, a few months ago, actually, I bought in a box. It was a Tortino pizza box. And it said on the box, imitation cheese. 
Is imitation cheese the same as real, genuine cheese? No, no way. Okay. Is imitation leather the same as real leather? No. no. Okay. So when you buy a Bible, it will say imitation leather on the cover, or it will say real leather. Okay, genuine leather. There's there's a reason they have to specify genuine leather as opposed to imitation leather, right? Okay. Robert Dietfuss, verse 1, chapter 11, verse 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Followers. As Christians, we are to be followers of Paul as he is a follower of Christ, right? In the transvestite Bible, what does it say? Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. Oh. Imitation Christians. And they think they are real. You know, it's like somebody who walks around with eating imitation cheese and trying to tell you that the cheese they are eating is real cheese. I mean, that's how dumb it is to use that book and say that it's the real thing. It gets wilder, Christian. It gets a lot wilder. Go to chapter 12. Robert, you read for me verse 3. Chapter 12, verse 3. Pay, pay attention. It says, The Lord. There's a difference between calling Jesus Lord and calling Jesus the Lord. Big difference. Read first verse 3. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. The Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Okay, read first the New King James. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Ghost. Did it say Holy Ghost? Holy Spirit, I'm sorry. Holy Spirit, yeah. They change it, takes away the ghost and make it spirit. But they say Jesus is? Lord. Lord. They took out the definitive article, the. Isn't that something? Okay, let's look at the calling into the ministry. Read for me verse 7, Robert, of chapter 12. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. Okay, you read for me verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Took out men again, okay? Then you see the different things, discernment and so on. Look at verse 11. Read verse 11, Robert. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Yours, Stephen? But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. See, they didn't just change in one place. Every time it has to do with the ministry being called, they change it from being a man to everyone, Right? Now, let me show you the manifestation of this. Go to chapter 14 for me, Robert and Stephen. Chapter 14. Robert, read for me verse... This is speak, talking about speaking in tongues in the church, right? And one of the requirements for speaking in tongues is that a man is the one who speaks in tongues. Women are to, to the main silent. This, this is the word of God. Read for us verse 27, Robert. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. Right? Okay, read first 27. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two, or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. Per the eight, little bit. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Okay, Stephen, you did it first. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. Took out man. Let me show you another thing that this Bible did. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 for me. So we see that this is the Bible for people who are going to be imitation Christians, the New King James Bible, as opposed to real Christians, right? We saw that they follow the transvestite game plan, okay? Changing everything, making it so that women can also now become pastors, right? They, they're changing every man to every one, Right? Okay, let me show you where they call Lucifer God. Take a look at this. Read for me, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, read for me verse 3, Robert. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So we have to deal here with the man of sin, the son of perdition, that's the Antichrist. The first three and a half years, he's called the man of sin. The second three and a half years, he is called the son of perdition. Read for me verse 7, please, love it. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. 
Question. In your Bibles, is the he uppercase or lowercase? Lowercase. Lowercase. You know why? Because it's an reference to the Antichrist, the son of perdition and the man of sin. So the man of sin is indwelt with the spirit of Judas Iscariot. The son of perdition is indwelt by the spirit of Lucifer. So the Bible says he, lowercase, because he's not God, right? Right. Okay, let's take a look at the transvestite's favorite Bible. (laughs) Let me ask you, Stephen, is the he in lowercase or is it in uppercase? It's uppercase. It's uppercase. They just called Lucifer God. Right there in the nudist King James Bible. The NKJV. Thank you, guys. You can be seated. So we see there that they... They call Lucifer God. They change the words from man to everyone. And then they tell you that you can be an imitation Christian. And then people will lift that up and say, call that the word of God from behind the pulpit. Shame on them. They will stand naked before God at the judgment seat of Christ. So what we see here is that the gold that you buy, tried in the fire, that is going to be your true worship in spirit and truth. You need the Word of God, the real Word of God, the inspired words of the living God. That's what you need to have. And people are going to despise you for that. People despise our church because we only use the King James Bible, the one that's inspired. Once you have the true Word of God, now you can work on your state, which is your own righteousness. That's your clothing. And you know what's going to happen when you do that? When you begin to walk in the Spirit and you become righteous, not self-righteous, but righteous because you're allowing the Word of God through the Spirit and the truth to work in you. You know what's going to happen? Your eyes are going to get opened. That's the anointing of the Holy Spirit that that is the Holy Spirit revealing to you through His Word the things that He wants you to see. And you see God for who He really truly is, just like the blind man in John chapter 9 could see the Lord Jesus, even though all these other Pharisees and educated people who were translating things from the Hebrew into the Greek, and this word means that, and they all thought they knew everything, they didn't see the Lord Jesus for who He was. But a person who had his eyes opened by the Lord, by the Spirit of God, can see these things, and the same is true for you today. You can see the truth for what it is if you allow the Holy Spirit through His Word to speak to you. And how are you going to get that if you're not even reading your Bible? How are you going to get that if you're not even in the Word of God to begin with? If you're just walking in the flesh? How are you going to get that? You see, the cure requires you to be in the Word of God and to obey it, and then your eyes are opened. It's that simple. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, you are good to us. We love you. We praise you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you've given it to us, Lord. Thank you that we can study it, Lord, that it can help us in our spiritual walk, Lord, and help us, Lord, that we will obey it, Lord. Keep us on that path, Father. Help us with that. And also, Lord, thank you so much that it allows us to see. We praise you for that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for listening to a recording from Shepherd's Grace Baptist Church. Please visit us at www.shepherdsgrace.org for more information.